So speaking about uh, Pillar Wallet and its features, um, can you tell more uh, the audience and what, what distinguishes and what makes a Pillar Wallet stand out uh, compared to its existing competitors and what should excite uh, Pillar, uh, Pillar Wallet users more? Okay. Um, the Pillar Wallet has been going since 2017. It was purely key-based wallet. Then we added a smart contract, smart wallet element to it where now it does give us the ability to have multi-chain access, say, within the EVM world, using Pillar Wallet, having the same smart contract address, you can have access to Polygon, Binance, XDive, Avalanche, Aurora, quite a lot of them in one go with the same address. And we found that to be key. In, in terms of the development of the, the Ethereum ecosystem, where the gas price is becoming a limiting factor, having the ability to have, to have access to all those things, to all those platforms in one go became key for us. And in, in doing so, we had the Pillar Wallet, the first um, off-chain sort of the implementation for the Pillar Wallet in early 2019. And that led us to effectively then separate the pillar wallet, the wallet side from the infrastructure side. So now we have Etherspot, the infrastructure packaged as an SDK on its own, supplying all the wallet needs of the, the pillar wallet. The pillar wallet is the app. So with this, now we even have the ability to go off chain using payment channels, not only for pillar wallet users, but even for MetaMask users or any other wallet users. So the pillar wallet is one of the earlier ones that has rolled out access to NFTs and various integrations with quite a lot of the players. And obviously we are the first ones to adopt Wallet Connect as well. So it, it, it gives us an ecosystem where we can manage our private financial needs going. So th that is the main selling point, the multi-chain aspect, the ease of access for multi-chain is the biggest selling point for Pillar Wallet. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's more than just a wallet. It's a, it's a platform, or as you said, it's an ecosystem uh, that uh, can create like, a, um, like an environment for users to not only uh, hold or transfer crypto, but also to interact with the different, uh, different blockchains, uh, different uh, dApps, uh, NFTs, and so on. So it goes beyond, uh, beyond uh, the classical wallets that we know in the space uh, that we are uh, all familiar with. Most definitely. I mean, the ideals of the Pillar project initially was to create a data, personal data locker with um, offers being aggregated to the wallet. And that is effectively achieved by all the integrations and all the parties bringing their services to this platform, so to speak. So yes, the concept, the wallet concept is changing and we're probably in due time will be going as a, a space wallet would be limiting because we're having services a lot which are a lot more than what a wallet defines yeah definitely yeah so something also i heard uh, is that you guys um, power or p p pillar is powered by what it's called ether spots yes. sdk can you tell more about this yes um, ether spot sdk is a framework for smart contract technologies. So what this brings is any of the smart wallet that we utilize in the pillar wallet is handled by Etherspot. So any DAP, any um, other wallet can integrate the service. So what this gives you is on top of that is payment channels. Payment channels are effectively uh, similar to layer two solutions where you can send a transaction, say, to someone without paying gas fee. So I, I can send you through the pillar payment, the Ethersport payment channel, I can send you X amount of tokens and you can to your MetaMask wallet and you can further send it to somebody else without paying any gas fee. 
So th that we believe is the way in terms of um, creating comparable services to the Web2 services that we have now. So Etherspot is um, basically an infrastructure that allows the creation of smart wallets, etc. I will give you an example how one of the use cases, imagine you have newcomers to the space who are just beginning to understand decentralization, but they want to experiment with the crypto space. Understanding wallets, gas prices, the different blockchains is a barrier to adoption. If you combine a bot on Discord with the smart wallet that we have to, to for the bot to have access to it and to send transactions on your behalf, just be, behalf, just because you've typed in tip Monir uh, X amount of tokens, wouldn't that be great? So that you tipping someone, you would not have to know or understand or even bother with going into understanding wallets or even using wallets. So the having the smart wallet, a smart wallet, which, in, which you can create sub-accounts uh, within a wallet is um, a really handy feature that Ethersport exposes. Yeah, that's super interesting. So other wallets can also use uh, the SDK in order to build similar features and especially payments, as you, as, as you were saying. Uh, just one, one question that just came to mind. Can we imagine a future where Pillar Wallet will have also Bitcoin and Lightning Network as well? That's an, I mean, funny you say that. A couple of years ago, we really wanted to integrate Bitcoin, but we realized that and we did halfway of the work, and but we realized, yes, it's one thing for us to have, okay, we've got Bitcoin in the wallet, but how much adoption would that gain? We found the Bitcoin dedicated user base versus the Ethereum user base being slightly different at the time. So yeah. we worried about, yeah, we will have a feature without not a whole lot of adoption. So then we went for the wrapped BTC and we integrated a service that has wrapped BTC within the pillar wallet. But um, from the Etherspot angle, we are exploring integrating very many other, even non-EVM compatible chains. Yeah, that's also the meme of uh, the first or the biggest use case of Bitcoin is Ethereum that maybe, uh, that maybe speaks, uh, speaks for that. It does, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, also you recently integrated the Paraswap API mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in order to uh, facilitate swaps uh, for your users. Yep. Um, can you tell us, first of all, why did you decide to integrate the Parasop API? Simple answer, demand from our user base. Why the demand from our user base? Because the users appreciated the ability to multi-route your given order to various DEXs and um, other aggregators by aggregating it. And that is even complemented by the fact that your given order can be multi-routed into many of different in, into different um, uh, sources of liquidity as well, not just um, having offers from any given one of them being sent to you, but a given order can be broken down into various chunks. So that was uh, highly appreciated by our user base, and we could not not integrate Paraswap after that. We had to do it. Yeah, I mean that's uh, also a natural, uh, a natural, I would say, a maturity phase in in wallets where it used to be uh, each wallet will choose a decentralized exchange and go with it, whether it's a Uniswap or a Kyber or a Balancer or something like that. But uh, the evolution we saw is that those wallets started integrating multiple DEXs where they would point out to the cheapest one. Mm -hmm. And the final iteration is, well, maybe we should just integrate an aggregator. Uh, we saw some that try to build an aggregator. It turns out that this is super complex and they ended up uh, integrating aggregators or aggregators of aggregators, which we call like meta aggregators. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, we offer uh, as wallet, I mean, wallets offer uh, best execution services to their users so that they don't have to worry about where is the cheapest price, uh, 
or even aggregators, the main value proposition is to deliver a price that is better than the market or what you call a parasol beating the market price. So yeah, the, it, the value proposition is quite clear. It's a net positive for everyone. Very interesting you say that, you see. In 2018, we had what we call an offers engine within our wallet. So whenever someone wanted to swap one token to another token, we hit out on all the different exchange providers and come back with offers. But what you guys have done is you've built two, three, four times more complexity and more ease and efficiency to it by making it a dedicated business. So this type of ecosystem growth and collaboration is the way I see the the, the whole blockchain um, system grows and brings delivers value to the users yeah i think that's a value we have in common on not only trying to create a good user experience in the uis we we built but also create a good developer experience or what you call the ux or whatever and that i think is also a key for success because there is a lot of noise in the space and developers have too many things to do. So building a quality APIs and easy to use and understand the APIs or tools in general uh, is a recipe for success because, uh, well, it may take maybe a few hours to a few days to go from zero to production, or it also can take weeks uh, just to uh, have something barely working. And I think uh, developer UX is the key to, succeed, to success. And we saw that in the SaaS industry, in the web 2.0 industry, where the shift for uh, worrying a lot about developer experience has made a lot of companies, especially SaaS companies, successful uh, to to get some mass adoption from from developers. So I think that's a, that's a that's a very interesting uh, very interesting point. And um, speaking also of, uh, about uh, pillar achievement in terms of partnerships and community, can you tell us more what you guys have achieved uh, in those regards? I mean, in terms of community development and future plans. I mean, in terms of community, I mean, we have integrated who is who of the space within the wallet. I mean, we have fiat on-ramp providers, both for worldwide, the US, and the US used to be a bit of a problem because of regulatory side, but we have the fiat on-ramp side integrated on both sides of the, basically the Atlantic, so to speak. And we have providers, um, things such as ANS names, um, unstoppable domains. I'm just going through basically the, the, the list that we have integrated. Is who is who of the spaces integrated? And uh, with this, um, obviously, we not only want to keep on integrating, we want to, we have also created a mechanism where not only do we integrate via the, via the wallet connect side, we have also created a mechanism where we can make it easier for direct integration from within the wallet. And this uh, is something that would be coming up soon where we've got a widget where we can, any service that is using a smart contract can be integrated far seamlessly with our services. And and we, we we obviously liquidity pools and uh, uh, any of the off uh, uh, aggregators you name them all your other competitors or the the guys that you aggregate from they're all integrated all the decks are integrated within our service and they are available as a service set from us and on top of that with the adoption of the the ethersport side we're really looking into um, utilizing bots and we are collaborating with a company called Collabland. And quite a lot of you might know them because they're quite um, useful in terms of if you have any Discord channels in, in terms of creating um, token permission rooms within Discord's channels. And with them, because they do utilize bots, we are exploring, well, working on an MVP and a roadmap with them in making wallets integrated with a, a bot 
So as I kind of mentioned earlier on, imagine you wanted to tip someone, all you could you have to do is go to your Discord channel and on the on the on the messaging line just type in exclamation mark tip at whoever whatever token you want to tip, and obviously that the bot will then take that and do the tipping for you. Yes, there are some things complexities that we are abstracting behind um, the bot and the integration, but this is something that we look forward in in, in terms of the easier we make the experience and the better and the less explicit we make that a wallet has to be used versus it is just a tool that I have to use. Now all I'm doing is just tipping. Why do I need to know that a wallet does that as long as it is handled for me? And in the same token, making it seamless, whichever blockchain that you are using. So if as a user, say when I use Twitter, I'm not interested or nor do I care whether Twitter use Oracle database or SQL Server or GraphQL in their background for to manage their data. It's not my job or my interest. So as the average user, it would come to a point where it wouldn't be my interest to know whether you're using Polygon or BSC or Ethereum, whichever blockchain, just make it available for me in a seamless way. Yes, maybe you can highlight something in terms of the transaction fee, but make it as abstract as possible. So that is the sort of world we're looking forward to with the various collaborations. That's super, super interesting. And I'll be definitely a user of that. I love this kind of uh, tipping bots and uh, and uh, also automation uh, from from social channels like Discord and Telegram. It's, it's super interesting. Um, I have some questions like... Um, for, to cover just some basics uh, for some users mm-hmm. uh, in order for them to understand uh, like the difference between uh, mainnet and, and sidechain users. Uh, um, that's, those are questions like for, 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 for us, we can, we can, we can discuss uh, briefly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the question is, what's the difference between mainnet and, cha- and uh, sidechain users? Uh, activities they engage on, the volumes, transactions, and uh, yeah, if we can have a discussion around that. Of course. I mean, by definition, the main net is meant, meant to have more security than the sidechain, whereas the sidechain is meant to have a lot more speed and a lot more throughput, so you can put more transactions and they should confirm quicker. But the cost that they have to pay on that is the the security is a little bit less and the price that you have to pay for gas is a lot less. Now, this are, if, if we work within this framework, then you can say, okay, what kind of users then are attracted to mainnet? Imagine I have, say, $1 million worth of, say, USDC, for argument's sake. Now, if I'm securing $1 million, the chances are I will probably leave that on mainnet and I will just use bits and pieces of that, maybe at $1,000 chunk or whatever, on the side chains for the tradings that I do because repeated trades would incur gas costs. And on mainnet, when you are interacting with the various DeFi platforms, the gas price can range from $50 to $200 per any transaction. So if I do that on the side chain, then it would be beneficial because I can do repeated trades. But once I lock in my gains, I would lock it on the mainnet, so to speak. And I will give you another example as well. If I am using an NFT, I have an NFT worth $400,000, the chances are I would be comfortable in paying a gas price of $50 or $100 so that I am securing a, an NFT worth $400,000. However, I am participating, say, in a specific TV program, which is mm, issuing NFTs as part of that TV program. Now, that would be what you would call a commoditized type of NFT. I was there kind of thing. So with those, as the average user, I'm probably not interested in paying 
five dollar for transaction fee, never mind fifty dollars. So those type of transactions, uh, NFTs, will probably be more at home on the side chains. This is on the asset side. How about the user base? A simple example for the user base for me is if I am from uh, one of the developing countries and I want to go, uh, to get into the Ethereum space and the DeFi platforms, there is no way on earth I can afford to pay $50 on gas price. As the average person, possibly my income for all the year would be $1,000. So I'm not going to spend 50 of that, or I can't afford to spend 50 of that on a gas price on one single transaction. So what we're talking about here is tens or hundreds of million, millions of people and mass adoption. So the side chains have the potential of making it easier and opening the door for those that are excluded just through the pricing of the gas pricing into becoming users of this new um, blockchain world. Well, in Parasop, we even saw uh, people paying around 2000 sometimes even more dollars in one transaction. Mm -hmm. Obviously, those are large transactions, mm -hmm. like over a million dollars in one transaction. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, I mean, it's like two years uh, average income in a, uh, in a poor country, uh, which, is, uh, which is insane, which means that uh, it becomes a whale's game. Uh, or maybe uh, Ethereum... Ethereum's future is to be a settlement layer for layer two solutions like Arbitrum, uh, ZKSync, uh, Optimism, and others. Um, so that's those uh, very high gas fees are no longer going to be paid by end users. They're going to be paid by rollups in order to uh, maintain the security of their chains by relying on the security of, of Ethereum. Because right now, yes, definitely side chains, the huge value proposition they brought is those low gas fees and providing the same uh, service like DeFi and NFT services to, to end users. So I think uh, the, va the value proposition is, is quite clear. It's hopefully, and it's, I mean, ha uh, and it's, it's kept kept the DeFi NFT uh, ecosystems running and scaling and uh, bring in millions of users that we've seen the last uh, the last 12 months. Most definitely, um, just on this point, apart from the practical side, even the ideals of self-sovereignty, inclusiveness of the non-included in the financial world that DeFi and the blockchain is, going, is meant to bring to us, we've kind of gone in a little bit exclusive right now because of gas price. So it is bringing, back, bringing it back to, so to speak, the blueprint by utilizing the side chains and the layer tools, et cetera. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so let's go to some uh, community questions. So there are a few. Uh, we just were able to select only some, uh, but we, if we still have some time, we can go, go through, through a few others. Go for it. So, so a question from Zero uh, X Ruslan uh, is uh, about PLR token. So the question is: Any plans about staking on farming PLR? Yes, um, we're actually working on uh, an APY staking um, initiative, which is um, uh, proposed by our community and our governors and community members voted for. So watch the space and within the next month or so, we would have a staking, um, a pillar staking initiative, um, which will be launched by our community. Amazing. And uh, also a question about uh, chains. Uh, while we were talking about uh, side chains, so what will be the next compatible chain? I mean, um, as we speak, we are launching on Aurora, and Aurora, for those of you that do not know, is a sidechain which is launched by Near. It runs on Near and is EVM compatible. And oh. yes, and we, we actually have been, um, we did um, provide our, our uh, POC on bot integration on Aurora. And we, we're collaborating with Collabland on Aurora to showcase some of those. And um, Avalanche should be integrated within our wallet soon. Because sometimes, because the wallet is a, effectively a subscriber to Ethersport, 
Ether support has a lot more integrations than we provide in the wallet. So you can look at the pillar company and the Ether support company as if they were different ones. So we have quite a lot of them. Not only uh, we have XDAI, BAC, Polygon, Avalanche, Phantom, Aurora, all these are integrated. So some of them appear in the wallet and definitely Avalanche should be coming up soon in the wallet. That sounds also very familiar to our structure. We have uh, the UI, Parasol.io, and the API, mm -hmm. which you can see them as two different products. So one is the infrastructure product with the API and smart contract and so on. The second one is one of the users of the API. So I feel like, you guys, this is what the structure you have built where um, the Ethospot SDK is the platform uh, and the pillar wallet is one of the users of that platform did i get that i right? think you've got it spot on and with the sdk the platform it is not only multi-chain it is a layer to it provide gives you layer two payment channel like services as well so yeah, yeah. definitely yeah that's uh, super impressive by the way the question was asked from token harvest um, a third question, it's, I mean, I have a hard time pronouncing, not pronouncing, but spelling the, the Twitter handle. It's mrl 58 etc. till 43. Um, the question is, uh, I'm quoting, audits is so important to find out vulnerabilities of smart contracts. Could you show us how strong your security is? Did PLR complete any audits by third parties? Very good question, and I agree with you. Mr. L58951743, um, yes, audits are very important. So what we've done is, so with, with the Pillar Wallet, when we first launched it, we had a security audit on it. Then we are subscribers to Hacker One the biggest bug bounty flat platform where pretty much hackers from all over the world take part in trying to break your system and they get rewarded for it. We, we have a hacker one program for the pillar wallet and it is put the smart contract infrastructure SDK itself. It has been audited by consensus diligence. If you go to itisport.io at the bottom of the page, you would see the detailed reports provided by consensus diligent. So what, how it works is when they go through the audit, they raise some points, you discuss with them and say and convince them or, or they convince you. As soon as that happens, you say, okay, you take X, Y, Z measures to address those issues. All those should be reflected in the audit report included in itasport.io. Awesome. Um, another question from Sui Win2. Uh, I'm quoting again, what is the biggest gap between our wallets and the little fox? Well, that means obviously MetaMask. Uh, why is this basically not well known? So the question is basically, I would say, what is the difference between Pillar and MetaMask? The biggest difference is from the technical aspect, MetaMask is a browser extension and Pillar is an app. So the, when we started out in 2017, our idea was, okay, people will be using apps and considering phone apps have become the ubiquitous in the way people use them. We thought, okay, in that case, people will be using apps and we went for apps. And obviously the MetaMask guy said, no, people will be using desktops and laptops. And from that perspective, if you look at the current user base, experienced user base in the, in the crypto space, they would say to you for main transactions, I actually use my laptop and I use my MetaMask. Quite a lot of them say that. On the other side, new users, users from developing countries who probably use their phones more than laptops do still use laptops and those people on the go and for quick transactions they use um, uh, phone apps now saying that um, the biggest difference between the metamask and the current pillar wallet is pillar wallet is a smart wallet metamask is a key-based wallet and it, it, it um, 
the pillar wallet started being a key-based wallet and it probably would have a key-based element to it soon enough. So th those are the differences. And, and what difference then does it make to have a key-based wallet versus a smart wallet, um, a smart contract wallet? A smart contract wallet um, gives you this flexibility where you can add things such as spending limits within the wallet. So I can add, uh, add a limit to say, okay, you can only spend this much from this wallet. You can add multiple accounts within the wallet, so effectively like a multi-signature wallet, where you, but with this multi multiple accounts, I can add another um, account to have access to it, just like a multi-signature, so to speak. And this aspect is the one that is allowing for the tipping bot to work. The tipping bot works because it would have access to a wallet that I use for everyday usage. The example I give on this one usually is when you use your contactless card, all you do is flash your card and walk away with the goods. But at the same time, in theory, someone with a card reader can swipe the minimum amount from your pocket while you are standing in a party, they can come with a reader and read and charge you for it in theory. The same sort of um, trade-off here as well. We you give the bot access to this wallet that you use for quick access, for quick uh, tipping, etc. But at the same time, it gives you ease of use. So th that's the thing, the smart contract versus the key-based wallet is the main thing. and. Other than that, user adaption comes with various aspects. And yeah, those are the main differences. Awesome. So a last question, or like a fifth question uh, from S. Joas, uh, that uh, looks more likely for, for Paraswap. What would be the main benefits that users will have for using your platform? Uh, well, I think uh, we covered that um, during the initial phase of the call. Uh, main benefit is getting a price that's better than the markets, or at least a, it is equal to the best price of the market. So, for instance, uh, if you're selling ETH for DAI and the best price out there is on Uniswap, well, that's the worst case you'll be getting. But the goal also of using an aggregator is getting a price that may be better than that because it's going to combine liquidity from Uniswap, from Balancer, from SushiSwap, and so on, in order to get a price that is better than the market. You can think of it as if you're booking a flight and using a kayak or sky scanner, that's maybe going to optimize your route and get you a deal that you won't fight by yourself. For instance, you're going from London to uh, New York, maybe a uh, sky scanner will tell you, hey, maybe you should go to Paris, then go to New York, because by doing so at this particular time for those particular airline companies, uh, you're going to get a price that is better than the market. Obviously, if you're okay for, for, for the waiting time, but also those aggregators will take that into consideration. We'll see if there is a co commute time, if there is a uh, hotel that you have to, to pick because you'll be sleeping at the airport and so on. So all those parameters are taken into consideration in running complex algorithms. Those are math optimization algorithms in order to maximize the return and minimize the, the fees. That's, that's what, you, what you would care about. And the final outcome should be higher than what you will get by yourself. So that's an advantage of using an aggregator in general, an advantage of using Paraswap. What's particular of Paraswap is we have now a DAO. So Paraswap is heading very quickly into uh, full decentralization. And the second thing is we also uh, made a bet on professional market makers as a complement to decentralized exchanges. So you may see something called Paraswap Pool, which is a network of uh, market makers. Those are traders. They offer an API that we connect to, and the settlement happen on chain. So in the eyes of the end user, there is no difference at all between a Uniswap and a Sushi or Balancer. But in terms of quality of execution, it's much, much higher because uh, the prices are fixed, so there is no uh, slippage, front-running, MEV stuff that we all know and don't like about the trading on-chain. And uh, for the market makers, we're uh, bringing them also in new markets 
to trade on instead of just staying on Binance uh, uh, or traditional uh, traditional exchanges. Uh, so it's a way to get into DeFi for some traditional players. It's a way also to have some institutions trading on chain because the barrier to entry is lower. They will be trading normally, but except that they will be trading on chain, but the quality of execution is as high as we, what we can see in, in traditional markets or traditional like uh, exchange exchange markets. So yeah, that's in a nutshell the difference. I mean, what's beneficial about using an aggregator and Parasop in, in particular? So I've got a question um, for you on this. So how do you qualify the market makers? Can any individual be a market maker that plugs in into Paraswap or you have to be a market making firm and there's a process to qualify for it? Um, in theory, yes, anyone can become a market maker, but in practice, it's hard because you need to maintain a server, uh, you need to maintain high load uh, for, for your API, and you also need to have a financial experience, like how would you price a token or like price a pair? That's not anyone uh, would have the skills to do it and do it without losing money. Mm -hmm. So the use cases for market makers in general are three. One is arbitrage. So they will buy in, on a Binance and sell a Paraswap and vice versa. Uh, the second one is... Uh, more sophisticated uh, directional positions on some tokens so they will buy up front and sell later so this is like traditional trading uh, and here they are trading on a new venue that is paraswap among among others and the third use case is some tokens will be working with market makers as a service for maintaining spreads and so on so these guys also are offering the tokens for those for those uh, for their clients uh, on binance on uniswap on sushi swap on any any venue that can bring uh, bring volume and their goal is to maintain the spreads not to have any kind of directional position is to if they will buy on a place they will sell on another and vice versa so those are the three figures in all of them as you can see is um, quite professional so hard for individuals to do uh, but having said that we know some individuals who have maybe worked at those kind of companies and they can start a business like that. They can tomorrow uh, look at our documentation and build the uh, new trading models and plug in into our API uh, right away. Obviously, they need to be able to maintain a servers uh, in order to, to run that efficiently. But also in the future, we're thinking about ways where this can be mutualized, where maybe some people will be able to run those servers and some other people can be can provide the capital to do so using platforms like Enzyme, for instance, uh, in order to uh, have the financial infrastructure to, 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 to do that. And this separation of role will democratize the market making industry for for at least in this in this context. So still talking about maybe a year, maybe less, more, more or less. But uh, yeah, right now at this stage, uh, there has to be some expertise uh, on the fi financial expertise and technical expertise. This is awesome. The evolution of the space is amazing. I remember when Uniswap was the next big thing and the incremental evolution since and what you say now with the market makers is awesome. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I think uh, it's also a key for uh, attracting uh, large capital, uh, like large institutions uh, to the space, mm -hmm. um, because it looks a lot like what we know in traditional uh, exchanges, like in TradeFi. Um, but we are using DeFi uh, stack as a backend. And I think this is the future of finance in general, where finance will no longer use this COBOL, uh, 70s and 80s uh, made uh, will maybe switch to DeFi and use DeFi technology as a as a backend for efficiency. And we are seeing this already happening. Like now, we are talking to some institutions and running some pilots with some institutions in order to have a paraswap that will be used by these institutions on with a layer similar to Ave Arc, where there will be KYC, AML, and so on. That's I mean, this is a, that's how the, the game is played in in this context. But the underlying technology is exactly the same. There is no change at all. It is just a layer on top of Paraswap that is used uh, for for institutions with the institutions roles, which is KYC, AML, and all of the stuff. Cool. Any final words, uh, Michael? I mean, it has been awesome talking to you and sharing your plans and your roadmaps and your experiences and also to see how the ecosystem is evolving. And um, I hope you will soon see 
your nearest communication tools, whether it's Discord or Telegram or whichever one, having the ability for you to send crypto and the wallet backed in into those communication tools near you. You using such tools without even caring about using things such as wallets or even the word wallet becoming defunct and it's just a platform. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's where we're headed to and we will be hoping to play such a big part with that and evolve together with platforms and services such as Paraswap. Indeed, indeed. I think that will be the key to, to mass adoption. Well, Michael, it's been a great pleasure having you in especially our first Twitter spaces. I think uh, the discussions went ama were amazing and uh, we're super happy. So maybe we'll do another one in a few months uh, or maybe a year from now to have the anniversary of the first uh, Twitter space. But anyways, it's been amazing having you uh, among us and, and, and discussing with you. Thank you so much. It's been awesome and I'm touched for being the first one. And most more than anything, I'm open for the anniversary as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Have a good one. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Thank Thanks, guys, for, for attending. And see you next time. Bye-bye.